so let's go ahead, Martin. Uh, today we are graced by uh, the presence of Pat Ganon, the state climatologist of Missouri. Uh, he put his uh, contact information in the lower right corner of his, um, his screen there. Hopefully you can all see that. Let me shut that noisy thing off. There we go. Um, and uh, welcome to the North Central Region uh, Climate Summary and Drought Outlook. Um, Pat, uh, oh, I'll just say quickly that we'll uh, address questions afterwards. So if you have any, uh, we do, there's a question box or a question panel if you want to put things in there as we go. We'll try to uh, get to those as best we can. If we have 50 questions, we'll get to about half of them. <laughs> so anyway, uh, if you have questions along the way or even afterwards, as far as that goes, uh, any of us can uh, attempt to answer those. So Pat, why don't you go ahead and start with your presentation? Thank you. Sounds good. Sounds good, Doug. Thank you and good afternoon and welcome everyone. I'll go right into it. I always like to, I, I've been given some nice pictures by various uh, collaborators across the region and always like to talk a little bit about what we've experienced over the past 30 days and, and show that visually. But uh, the last speaker, um, Becky Bollinger gave a, uh, an excellent talk and she mentioned about, of course, we had that experience with the uh, two week cold wave back in February and uh, Becky had, gave some great information on that. But as we went towards the end of Febu uh, February, we had a big precipitation event. And you can see in the upper left, those two pictures, uh, that's from a webcam uh, from Kentucky a mesonet station in the upper left that was taken on May 8th a few years ago. And then that's the same picture from the same weather station showing what happened in early March. There actually that event, it was a major precipitation event that really hit Kentucky pretty hard and a little bit of Southern Indiana and Southern Ohio, but uh, it fell on February 28th, but there was a big response with the rivers and streams and obviously some major flooding with that particular incident. And you can see just how high, the, how high those waters got. Uh, the image right below that, there was another significant event that impacted parts of Southern Missouri on uh, Southern Illinois around March 12th with some flooding and some water rescues reported in Southern Illinois. And in the middle two pictures, how can I not talk about or not show pictures of birds when we're in the middle of migration season? But uh, these again were pictures taken from a mesonet, the top middle picture are um, sandhill cranes that were uh, landed near a weather station, the mesonet station that took a picture of the cranes in Kentucky as they were migrating. And then Doug Cluck, our host, he, on the picture below that, took this picture yesterday in Northwest um, Missouri, Southwestern Iowa, showing the snow geese, but also were on their migration routes and taking a rest in a farm field. Upper right, uh, the other big event, I think during over the past 30 days, we had the flooding and of course this one, the one most recently, uh, this past weekend, we had a major winter storm and also some bigger precipitation, more in the form of rainfall as that storm translated eastward. But these were pictures provided by uh, Becky Bollinger here in northeastern Colorado. The top right picture shows uh, snow depth me measurements that were knee deep high in Loveland, Colorado. And then the picture below that is the Colorado State uh, University weather station in Fort Collins. And you could see where obviously these, this was a snow event that was measured by the feet. It was a big historic event impacting mostly Southeast um, Wyoming, north, the front range of the Colorado, the Northeast Colorado and the Western Panhandle of Nebraska. A little bit of housekeeping, uh, some general information. These are the climate services, uh, provided, providing climate services to the central region. It's a collaboration among state climatologists and NOAA entities, uh, the USDA climate hubs and the regional climate centers. Our next Outlook webinar will be given by Dennis Toddy from the USDA Midwest Climate Hub. That'll be on Thursday, April 15th. Access to this information, this is being recorded and there will be a PDF available and those are the web links where you could access um, this webinar as well as those in the past. So today's agenda, we're gonna talk a little bit about February. We'll go over meteorological winter for December, January, and February, a little bit of a recap. We'll look at the more recent conditions over about the past 30 days. 
<clears throat> we'll talk about snow, we'll water, hydro, hydro situation, flood, drought, and soil information. We'll break it down into each of the states, see what those impacts were. We'll go through the latest climate outlooks and we'll take some questions and comments at the end of the session. So let's go right into the <clears throat> February temperature ranks. So the, these are the statewide average temperature ranks for the month of February. And you can see those blues are various. Uh, we had a cold February and that was mostly due to a two week event. <clears throat> in February, we, February, where we saw those cold conditions, that brought those departures down. Uh, those deeper shades of blue are much below average temperatures. We had top 10 coldest Februarys in Nebraska and Iowa, in Missouri and in Kansas, as well as in Oklahoma and Arkansas. Uh, it's interesting to note that uh, this cold wave was more intense in the Central Plains and Southern Plains and less intense as you go further north. Uh, there was a big event a couple of years ago, back in 2019, that was more intense uh, in the Northern Plains. And that was because that, that period it was longer than a two week period. It was a longer cold wave that lasted across the North Central US. And that was actually more severe than the two week cold wave that we experienced just last month. Uh, obviously things were worse though, as you went further South into the Central Plains with those colder conditions where that 2019 cold did not penetrate as far south as it did this year in uh, 2021. It was the coldest February for the contiguous US in over 30 years. You have to go back to 1989 and it ranked as the 19th coldest February in 127 years. So we finished our three meteorological winter months, December, January, and February. Uh, how did those rank um, across the North Central US? And you can see what's interesting to know on the big image on the left show the uh, warmer than normal conditions for that three month period across, you know, much of the uh, north central US, the upper Midwest. But as you go a little further south into parts of Kansas and Missouri, it actually turned out to be a below normal winter. And that's complements to that two week period that we saw in February, where temperatures over that period were more than 20 degrees below normal. That actually countered what we saw in December and January. And so on the far right, uh, the top right is December ranks and then January and February. So those are our three uh, winter months. And you can see how warm it was. It was in December, it was the record warmest in one climate division in Southwestern North Dakota, much above normal conditions in North, north Central US. And in January that also continued in the North Central US with much above normal temperatures. And then of course we got hit by that cold wave in February and that, that was, that's why we see a lot of blue in the middle part of the country with those below normal temperatures. But all in all, you know, December and January, January were unusually mild across much of Montana into the Northern Plains and upper Midwest, but it was that really intense two week cold wave that mitigated these conditions for meteorological winter. <clears throat> so what about uh, precipitation for February? Uh, things were dry across much of the northern plains into the central plains. You can see North Dakota experienced their 12th driest of February on record, as well as Minnesota. Kansas had their 11th driest um, February on record. A little bit wetter conditions around Montana and Wyoming. Uh, a little bit wetter conditions as you go further or near normal, near average conditions in parts of the Midwest. But overall, uh, Kansas ranked 11th driest, while North Dakota and Minnesota had their 12th driest February. Let's, let's break that down into the winter months. On the left is the December through February combined. And what really sticks out is that that dry winter conditions we're seeing, you know, starting from Western Colorado into parts of Wyoming, much of Eastern Montana, throughout North Dakota, the Northern Plains and, and the upper Midwest, the winter has been dry. North Dakota experienced their third driest winter on record and records go back 127 years. On the right, we break it down in December, January and February. Again, you can see that dryness that's really persistent in the Northern Plains. Uh, that's concerning considering the, we've seen some droughty conditions that have been ongoing for several months in parts of the Northern Plains. So something we're gonna need to pay close attention to as we go further into the spring season. Let's look at the most recent conditions or over the last 30 days. Well, that two week cold wave we had in February was pretty much just a, a memory 
of the overall trend we've been seeing. Um, from February 19th through March 17th, that was at the end of that cold wave and things just rebounded to the way things have been for much of the winter is, and for that matter, for much of the, or the cold season starting from November and January. Uh, March has been very similar to those warm conditions we saw in November and December and January. And you can see those departure from normals running more than nine to 10 degrees above average. There was little to no snowpack <clears throat> this winter in North Dakota. And so that contributes to these warmer temperatures uh, hanging out up there this winter. And then, uh, but much of the eastern part of the um, central region, at least east of the Rockies, we've seen the, these above normal conditions, above normal temperatures persist for about the past 30 days or so. Precipitation, we obviously had a really big event more recently in the middle part of March. And uh, you can see the numbers here over the past 30 days. Those, those yellows and oranges are drier conditions, not much precipitation over the past 30 days across Montana and to North, North Dakota, Northern South Dakota, parts of Northwest Minnesota, and on into the, into the Midwest, the upper Midwest, parts of Southern Wisconsin, Northern Illinois, Northern Indiana, Northern Ohio, and much of lower Michigan and running below normal this winter or this past 30 days. As you go further south, you can see that major precipitation event that did impact Kentucky I talked about earlier. Also parts of the Ohio River Valley around southern Indiana, southern Ohio. And then, of course, more recently, that big event that impacted the, the front range of the Rockies, southeast uh, Wyoming and throughout uh, southern South Dakota, all in Nebraska, much of Kansas and on into Missouri and southwest Iowa. It was a big event that brought a lot of precipitation to that region. This is the precipitation percent of mean for the past for the last 30 days. Anything in those blues are indicative of uh, above uh, or surpluses, above average precip. And uh, that's mostly complements of what we've seen over the past seven days in, in Nebraska and parts of Kansas and Colo Northeast Colorado and Southeastern Wyoming. And again, when you go further north and to the east, you see those reds where you see those very dry conditions over the past 30 days across the, the Northern Plains into the upper Midwest, especially Northern Minnesota. And then also down in southern Wisconsin, northern Illinois, southern Michigan, northern Indiana, and northern Ohio. It's interesting to note to look at some of those purples you see in, in Nebraska and Colorado and Wyoming. Those are some incredible percent of normals for the 30-day period, 400% of normal. And that occurred mostly, mostly in within just a few days. I mean, there were some precept reported in, in parts of northeast Colorado where they received in just a, a handful of days, which is more typical of what you would receive during the entire season from November, December through, through March. So indeed a highly unusual and heavy event and welcome for that matter because of the antecedent dry conditions that have been in that area. This is radar estimate. I talked about just how, no, how significant that precipitation event was back last weekend, back in the middle part of March. Anything in yellow, these are radar estimates. This shows the yellow is two or more uh, inches of water equivalent precipitation. Uh, that's a lot of rainfall over a lot of real estate. It's just amazing to see those totals. And when we look, we, we see southeastern Wyoming anywhere from two to three, even more than four inches of precip noted across all of Nebraska. Look at those totals in the central and eastern part of the state. Those shades of red, five or more inches of precip. I will note that it was, you know, it was just a couple years ago, back in 2019, we had somewhat of a similar situation around this time of year that led to some incredible flooding in the area that translated down the Missouri River into, in, into Missouri. Uh, the antecedent conditions are the big reason why we, aren't, we didn't witness that sort of similar situation this year. Back in March of 2019, we still had a decent snowpack on the ground, the, 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 the soils were frozen. And so when that precipitation occurred, most a lot of it just rainfall, it immediately translated to runoff, it melted the snow, and you got this incredible pulse of water that really ramped things up and brought those major flooding conditions across that area. We just didn't have that this year because of the antecedent conditions where soils were thawed out, there was no snowpack, and it has been very dry in the area. So uh, 
just a different scenario that we saw a couple of years ago, even though so much precipitation fell over a fairly short period of time. So let's look at some of the snow water uh, situation, the hydrological situation. On the left is the accumulated snowfall uh, beginning with October 1 during the water year up through March 18th. And you can see uh, those various shades of greens and the, those blues, some big snowfall totals in parts of Colorado, Wyoming, and Nebraska, and mostly uh, a complementary of this most recent snowstorm in that area of the, of the central region. Some greener conditions as you go eastward into Nebraska, darker green in Iowa, where they had some decent snowfall. On the right, we, that's the departure from normal. You can see where snowfall has been running above normal and below normal for the for the season, for the cold season, and you get a little bit of a stripe of above normal conditions, uh, generally from Southern Wyoming through Nebraska, Iowa, into Northern Illinois, parts of the Eastern Corn, Corn Belt. It's interesting to note that even though precipitation actually is below normal in parts of the Eastern Corn Belt, but at the same time, some areas uh, are seeing above normal snowfalls. You don't, you don't see that sort of situation very often. Also interesting to note in the UP of Michigan how you know, there haven't been many Arctic air intrusions uh, for throughout the cold season. It's been a very warm period up in that area. And that Arctic air, that's when it flows over the, the warmer waters of the Great Lakes. That's what translates to these lake effect snows. And they just really haven't seen nearly as much this year because of the warmer conditions and lack of Arctic air impact in the area. And so we're running quite a bit below normal in uh, the UP of Michigan and along the uh, the shores of western lower Michigan. Where running below normal in regard to snowfall. This is the current snow water equivalent. Uh, that big snow event in March, mid-March dropped quite a bit of snow across uh, parts of Northeast Colorado, the front range of the Rockies and Southeastern Wyoming. A little bit of stripe of snow. It looks like uh, perhaps as much as a trace to one inch of snow water equivalent across the uh, Northern Nebraska, the Dakotas and, and Southern half of Minnesota into Wisconsin. But uh, 10 to 20 inches of snow water equivalent uh, are in the Rockies, according to this modeled map of snow water equivalent. This is a map shown from NRCS showing snow water equi equivalent. I'm going to focus on the area on the east of the Continental Divide. Most of the snowpack is, is that in Montana and Wyoming and east of the divide in, in Colorado are near normal. They're, they've been given some pretty good bumps. And that snowpack with that recent big event uh, over the weekend in, in Colorado, as well as in uh, Wyoming. The highest uh, snow water equivalent is attributed to the pack northwest, but drier conditions also to the south. This is the uh, Missouri River Basin, the mountain snowpack water content. On the left is the total above Fort Peck. Uh, you see the blue arrow and the blue going right to this area right here. As of March 16th, it's running a little bit below average. It's about 88% of the March 16th average. Not much of a bump over the past week because they didn't receive the snowfalls. That was mostly to the south, uh, accompanying with that big storm over Colorado and, and parts of Wyoming. On the right, total Fort Peck to Garrison. Again, a little bit better, 93% of the March 16th average, but again, not much of a bump due to that recent precipitation event we saw just areas to the south. Look, this is a, of a, a different story though. There was some improvement seen in the North and South Platte mountain system. On the left, you can see on the total North Platte, it's running 94% of average. Look at that bump that it made over the last week, up 9% thanks to all that precipitation that fell over the past weekend. And on the right for the total South Platte, Again, a noticeable bump going up 13% from last week, 89% of average. So the front range snowstorm last weekend, it increased the water supply in both the North and South Platte mountain system. This is a map showing the seven day average stream flow as of yesterday, uh, generally above to much above average stream flows across the lower Missouri basin in this area from central Nebraska to southern Missouri, and parts of the upper Mississippi River Basin from central Wisconsin 
to northern Illinois. You can see the little bit more dryness though is that areas we talked about earlier below to much below average stream flows running from central Illinois into northern Indiana, southern Michigan, northern Ohio. Also a lot, noted a little bit of area of dryness here, lower stream flows in southwestern or southeastern Kentucky. But you can see a lot of the blues and the even some records, some record stream flows for this time of year reported or not seen here in southeast Kansas and southern Missouri. We'll break it down into the RF, the, the river forecast centers. These are some stream gauge reports coming out of the Missouri Basin River Forecast Center. I focused here on the lower part of the Missouri Basin because that's where a lot of the rainfall has been occurring over the past week or so, past couple weeks. And you can see. We do have some conditions where minor to major flooding is already ongoing or forecasted. It looks like even further downstream than the, the Missouri River, these are forecasts for some moderate flooding uh, here in eastern uh, Missouri. Even a, a forecast, this is the Blackwater River for some major flooding is forecast over the next day or so. So we are seeing some responses to all this rainfall we've seen over the past week or so. This is the the, for, the the river, the National Weather Service North Central River Forecast Center. Uh, better conditions as you go north, at least in regard to no flooding. But as you go further south, with this most recent precipitation event that's been occurring over the past couple of days, we've had some big rainfalls in this area. Minor to moderate flooding is occurring or forecasted over the next few days. So something to keep an eye on as we go later on into the weekend. The weekend. This is the Ohio River Forecast Center showing again minor flooding occurring or forecast across here parts of southern Indiana into and then that's pretty much the area where minor to moderate flooding is occurring or forecast over the next few days. Looking at the Great Lakes ice cover, well you got to look hard to find any ice. It's been going down uh, since uh, over the past few weeks, especially with these warmer March conditions. Uh, down to 7.3 percent covering uh, all the Great Lakes and so I looking real quickly here I maybe around just uh, around the Door Peninsula I, I believe that's the Bay Area of Green Bay Green Bay and then northern parts of uh, Lake Michigan over here in eastern parts of Superior not a lot of ice out there and of course they've had a very mild winter for much of the season going all the way back into November around the Great Lakes Looking at the levels, check, looking at some of the master gauges that I've highlighted here uh, at Superior, right here in Marquette. Uh, the last year was, a, a, you know, the, the levels are still, still running pretty high. This blue line shows as of March 15th, it's running above average, which is a green line, but it's below the record levels that we witnessed last year here at Lake Superior. And, you know, there were record levels last summer into the fall. But with these warmer conditions, uh, more evaporation are going into the winter with some above average evaporation and with below average precipitation, those, those levels have been dropping, but nonetheless, they still are above normal uh, as of mid-March. At Michigan Huron, this is the gauge at Harbor Beach. You can see again, uh, not at the levels we saw last year in 2020, but nonetheless, well above the average. Uh, as of March 15th, and then over in Lake Erie at, at Fairport, Ohio, somewhat of a similar situ uh, situation as the other lakes were not near the levels that we saw the record levels last year, but nonetheless still running about above average with the blue line here. This and is Pat, the latest. Yes. Yeah, just a, <clears throat> if you want to go back to the Great Lakes uh, thing there. Uh, what we didn't show here is the outlook uh, from the Army Corps and uh, generally those show that even though it's been dry in the Great Lakes and, and the values are dropping off from their record highs and what they were last year as well, um, they're still going to be above normal for quite some time. So expect the Great Lakes to be above normal. That's it. Thank you. Sounds good. Thank you. Uh, yeah, the lines do indicate they're still quite a bit above average, even uh, just not yeah, nothing like the, the record levels that we saw last year, but still running high. This is the drought monitor map from that came out this morning showing the, the dry conditions that just won't go away across the, much of the northern part, north, northern part of the north central U.S. and the western into Colorado. Extreme to exceptional drought conditions impacting western parts of Colorado. 
even parts of Southeast, East Central on into Central Wyoming. And then of course the area up in uh, North Dakota and parts of Eastern Montana where we still see some extreme drought conditions. A little bit of improvement. We'll go, I'll show, I'll reflect where we see this improvement. A lot of it's due to that big winter storm with all that precipitation that fell uh, last weekend across much of this area. There were some two category improvements because of the heavy precip that impacted parts of Northeast Colorado and Southeast Wyoming. But most one category improvements in all of pretty much all of Nebraska, Southern South Dakota, Western, Southwestern Iowa, Northern half of Kansas, a lot of improvement. Unfortunately, worsening drier conditions denoted uh, category deterioration in parts of North Dakota and Montana, as well as a little bit here in Western Illinois, Northeast Missouri. I have a feeling that will be going away next week, uh, but also deterioration in Northern Ohio, as well as parts of a little bit of North uh, East Indiana with the drought conditions. The soil moisture does reflect pretty, you know, the, that wetter condition we've seen over the past uh, several days across the Central Plains. Uh, and this is uh, an anomaly that, that provides the soil profile using modeled information going down to about five feet, but does show these dry conditions, uh, the anomaly across the Mich Southern Michigan, Northern Indiana, Northern Ohio, and into North Dakota, what we talked about, of course, here in parts of Colorado, some very dry conditions as well. But we did get some, some uh, mitigation of the, the soil profile in regard to the the big event we saw this past weekend in parts of the Plains and, and Colorado and Wyoming. These are soil temperatures at the four inch level. Uh, the frost line is starting with these really mild March conditions uh, compared to what we saw in February. That frost line is retreating northward. Uh, there are These are showing the pretty much uh, no frost line in, in Nebraska and much of Iowa, Illinois, Missouri and Kansas. Uh, perhaps I did hear reports that southern Minnesota has pretty much thawed out, even southern Wisconsin. You can see these reports out of uh, North Dakota, especially eastern parts of North Dakota, where the, we still have a frost line, probably northern, north, south Dakota parts of uh, the probably northern half of Minnesota on into northern Wisconsin. We still have a frost line, but nonetheless, it has been retreating northward over the past few weeks, especially with those real, really mild conditions we had during the, the first couple of weeks of March. We did, did get a little bit of vegetative response, uh, especially of the southern parts of, around Kansas and Missouri on into Kentucky with the mild March conditions. They've been somewhat tempered over the past few days. Over the past few days, uh, conditions, is, growing conditions has slowed down somewhat because of the cooler weather, the cooler conditions. But nonetheless, we have seen a little bit of green up and that, that is noted by this map, the first leaf index, which extends all the way up into northern Kansas, central Missouri. And I will note that um, it was a little bit concerning back in early March when the, some of the vegetation was coming up a little bit too early. But over the past five, six, seven days, it's really not grown any at all because of the cooler weather we've seen uh, over the past few days. So I'm not gonna go through all of this. Again, this, this webinar is recorded, so you're more than welcome to, to go check the recording or look at the PDF if you wanna read the whole map. But uh, these, uh, we get a lot of great information from the collaborators who, who work with, with putting together this, uh, this webinar and, and submitting it once a month. So uh, I feel obligated. I gotta put everything out there when they provide all this good information. And for me, the best way to do it is just to break it down into the states and try to fit in as much as I can with some a lot of the impact reports that we've been getting. Uh, I will say that it when you when you look at the 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 text here in all the states, a lot of it is related to you know extreme event situations like we saw the flooding in Kentucky back at the end of February and early March. And then the mid-March snowstorm that dropped so much precipitation across Wyoming, parts of Wyoming and Colorado and on eastward into uh, Nebraska, Kansas, Iowa, and Southwest Iowa. So uh, feel free to perhaps uh, when you have some time and this is recorded, you can go through some of the, some of the information. I will note more recently, uh, I'll just focus a little bit here on Colorado and Wyoming because it was such of an impactful event but it, it just brought some really big improvement. 
especially east of the Continental Divide. Uh, and I talked about how the two category improvements across uh, in one week. And then also there was there were some reports on the livestock impacts that actually came out of the Colorado Extension offices. I ran out of room in Colorado, so I fitted it up here in Wyoming. But obviously there was some big impacts in southeast Wyoming with ranchers and all that snow. But uh, particularly there were particularly there were a few reports that that some of the calves would get covered in snow and they'd, and they'd be trampled by the cattle. So fortunately that wasn't a common occurrence and there was nothing anything widespread or in regard to losses. I do want to note North Dakota and parts of eastern Montana where that drought is ongoing. You know, they did have one of their driest winters on record, and it was their driest September through February on record. So we're going back six months to find dryness that's unprecedented, going back 127 years. And so you get a lot of impacts when you go that long. And it is critical that precipitation needs to return to this area, or these impacts are only going to multiply. And so hopefully, you know, we'll see a pattern change with more precip, especially in this region where it is so dry not to mention what we're seeing in parts of western and southwestern Colorado. So we'll go right into the climate outlooks. Uh, we'll go with it and uh, I'll jump right into it. This is the seven day precipitation forecast. Well, we're really jumping into spring when it comes to precipitation opportunities. Um, it looks like another impactful system over the next seven days. Uh, especially from southern Minnesota down through Iowa, Missouri, and to Arkansas, all the way down to the Gulf Coast. Those are some totals that are running anywhere from the blue is about a half inch to over two inches in this purplish area you see in parts of northwest Iowa. That actually would be nice to receive because that's the driest part of Iowa is the northwestern part of the state. And so Hopefully, you know, those soil temperatures have thawed out and there'll be some opportunity. If this forecast verifies, we're gonna get some good infiltration of that moisture into the soil profile. Uh, what we really don't need is more precip in Missouri. And, uh, you know, they're missing out, unfortunately, in that dry, those drier areas of Northern Illinois, Southwest, Southeastern Wisconsin and Southern Michigan, and it looks like far Northern Ohio and Indiana, according to this forecast, that heavier precip is gonna be just to your South. But, it does look like uh, some significant precip though forecast all the way from Minnesota down to Louisiana. This is the six to 10 day temperature and precipitation outlook that will cover us for next week. Uh, and you can see on the left, it does look like an enhanced likelihood of, across the Eastern half of the country for above normal temperatures, cooler conditions as you go West across the Southwest from Southern Wyoming down to Colorado and to New Mexico. It does look like more uh, perhaps unsettled weather as well with the uh, above normal precipitation indicated for much of the NWS central region. Unfortunately, it, well, it's not below, but nonetheless, it looks like maybe near average precip across the northern plains on into eastern Montana. But um, there looks like there might be some potential to help alleviate the dryness that we're seeing in parts of uh, Michigan and Ohio, Indiana by next week with the other precipitation chances. This is uh, the new outlook that just came out this morning for the month of April, temperature and precipitation. On the left, I see a lot of orange and shade, various shades of orange. There are indications that April will average above normal, at least the strongest or highest likelihood is in this darker shade of orange. Uh, and it does look like above normal temperatures are anticipated across all the, pretty much all of the NWS central region. And then on the right, uh, below normal precip is in the cards, at least according to the forecasters, there's, there's a little bit of an enhanced likelihood of below normal precipitation, not good for uh, you know, Western Colorado where they really could stand to use some more precipitation. Equal chances across the West of the, the, the North Central area for precipitation, a little bit more uncertainty when it comes to precip for next month in that part of the, of the country. This is the three month outlook, April, May, and June. Again, hot off the press, showing a lot of the country covered in various shades of orange for above normal temperatures for the April, May, June period. Highest likelihood across the Southern half of the country. On the right, we see below normal uh, precipitation indicated not good when we consider much of the Western half of the country is still experiencing some form of drought category. Below normal precipitation is anticipated. That extends all the way eastward 
with just a slight enhanced likelihood across Northeast Wyoming, Southern Montana, Western Nebraska, the Western half of Kansas. Above normal precept is anticipated perhaps for the upper Midwest. And that extends downward into Eastern Illinois, much of all of Indiana, Ohio, into the Eastern half of Kentucky for above normal spring precipitation for using them, looking at the months of April, May, and June. <clears throat> this is the June, July, August temperature and precipitation outlook to our summer outlook. Uh, it does look like all of the country is painted in a shade of red. <laughs> uh, it looks like the highest likelihood will occur in the Southwest. Of course, we do have drought conditions that I'm sure that was taken into consideration of the antecedent soil moisture conditions that are ongoing, very dry conditions, but there are even the even all of the Corn Belt is forecasting a, a slight enhanced likelihood of above normal temperatures this summer. And that dryness, it looks like it, it was shifted a little bit further north and northeastward for the summer for below normal precipitation with the highest likelihood extending from, um, oh, from Montana through the Dakotas, most of the Dakotas, Western Minnesota, Northwest Iowa, all of Nebraska and Northern Kansas. So it'll be interesting to see if this, forecast verifies, but it does look like uh, above normal conditions uh, for temperature, at least into the spring as well as into the summer. That pretty much wraps up my presentation for today. I just, I will uh, reiterate, reiterate that these recorded, these um, presentations are recorded and are available at the Regional Climate Center's websites, the Midwestern Regional Climate Center and the High Plains Regional Climate Center as well as uh, other uh, resources where you can get from some of our partners. I listed the web links here. And I, I uh, Doug, I tried to keep it down to 40 minutes, like you said, so I'm almost yeah. there, but thank you. And uh, again, I thank, thanks so much. And I'll hand it back over to you, for you Doug. For thank you very much. Thank you very much, Pat. Uh, it was excellent. You, uh, like, like you're a comrade, you covered an uh, incredible amount of information in a very short period of time and uh, that's what I think people uh, get on these for to some degree. Um, if you'd back up a few slides maybe to uh, oh the monthly outlook let's start with that and just leave that up yeah for now because um, we might be coming back to this when we talk about uh, some of the issues that we could be seeing uh, April into the summer so just in case we, we need that. Um, okay, uh, I'm going to start at the top here, uh, and, and by the way, we have Dennis Toddy on, who's going to be the speaker next month, and sort of a pivotal month, if you will, from a, at least from a growing standpoint, and uh, what we're going to be discussing in the next couple minutes, it, uh, from a growing season as well as uh, 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 the problem with too much warmth and too much dryness, if you will. And sometimes if just with the dry, uh, warmth alone, uh, that can present some problems, uh, obviously from a, a late freeze point of view, as well as in evaporation or trans, evapotranspiration point of view. And both, both Pat and uh, Dennis can speak to that at some point here. Um, so let me try to get through this as quickly as I can. I did post, if in case you're interested, I did post something called uh, NOAA's Spring Outlook, which came out today. That's uh, a bunch of different parts of NOAA came together to uh, uh, put that together. Uh, there's a link, if you will, in the chat section, and um, I may send that out on my uh, regional list as well, uh, in case you, in case if you didn't, if you can't see that. Um, that's more or less what it's going to more or less present what we did here today, but broadly across the nation. So that, like I said, is something you may want to see. Um, so question, one of the questions that we got was, uh, was February's uh, two weeks cold snapper response to the polar vortex and uh, a destabilization from the polar vortex and what was happening at the North Pole at the same time. So generally we talked a little bit about this the last, last month, but um, it was a delayed response to a, <laughs> sudden stratospheric warming event, which I won't go into great detail uh, for a lot of reasons, uh, that happened. And they're not that common, but they're also, 
you know, once every other year or every two or three years or something like that, those those types of things happen. And some part of the northern hemisphere, in this case, um, usually catches the brunt of that cold air when um, there is this, if you will, destabilization and lobes of cold air can move much further south than they normally do and be pretty intense like we just saw. Um, what was happening at the North Pole at the same time? Well, there's almost always a counter effect. So when the cold air moves from the cold uh, from the pole, uh, it's usually replaced by uh, anomalously warmer air. I'm, I'm probably not in every case, but in a lot of cases, that that's what happens. So there's only so much cold air to go around. Is one way to look at that. Uh, any comment on the? Okay, yeah, it, this is. Any comment on lake of oh why the lake effect was so meager compared to average and and again it was the lack of consistent cold air over the Great Lakes that usually what spawns lake effect snows so you need a lot of cold air uh, uh, moving over the lakes to have snow on the opposite side of where the where the cold air is coming from thus the uh, the upper peninsula and such uh, that's in a nutshell why. Um, Another question is why are we comparing 1981 to 2010 normals? Um, you know, this is kind of a, oh, I'd say something internal <laughs> to the climate business, but it has been agreed upon by the World Meteorolo Meteorological Organization uh, that we will use a 30-year time period to compare normals to. It's a relative thing. So every 30, every 10 years, we move it 10 more years. So in May of this year, of 2021, we will begin comparing all of our normals, like maps that you're seeing uh, that uh, uh, Pat presented here, we'll be using the 91 to 2020 normal period. And right now, all those numbers are being figured and analyzed and all that stuff gridded so that we can use them more readily. Um, it doesn't mean it doesn't mean we don't have the option to compare it to the whole period of records. Let's go back to 1880 or so. We can do that too, or any other 50-year period or 70-year period. It's just commonplace and uh, sort of the agreed-upon way to uh, compare to normal. Now you may see changes, especially in the early part of the decade, if you will. Uh, in terms of um, things not appearing to be as warm um, as, uh, you know, not, not breaking the warming, uh, the, 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 temp the abnormal, te the anomalous temperatures may not appear to be as warm as they used to. <laughs> That'll change. And wet, and, wet, and wet may not be as wet. because and wet may not be as wet warmest. because we're using yeah. new normals, if you will, 30-year normal. Right. Thank you. Um, as the Earth evolves and changes, that will all change as that 10 year period goes along. It still doesn't, you can still go back if you want to take a longer look at things, to look at trends, uh, uh, to, uh, to better look at, yeah, to better look at trends and how, how the climate is really changing over time. So it's a relative thing, that 30 year period. Uh, okay, and then um, one of these questions from uh, Dennis, you can address this prospects that better snow water equivalent prospects for for that better snow water equivalent to be needed for irrigation this growing season and i'm i'm not sure, exactly sure how to rephrase that but go ahead dennis <laughs> that, I, I i'm guessing that means nebraska and like there's probably some irrigation out of the Ar arkansas river along it um the the additional soil water or snow water equivalent was beneficial to provide additional runoff capability. Um, as you saw in the outlooks Pat showed, um, it you know there's a very good chance of warmer than average conditions and increasing chances of drier as we go on through the year that would increase the need for irrigation throughout the places that are irrigated. So that may come in handy and be beneficial to those areas. Uh, are there concerns also, Dennis or Pat, uh, about delayed planting of corn and soybeans due to dryness in some areas and ex ex excess moisture in others? I don't know, Pat, what, are you, what do you think down in your area since think, you're a little wetter? I'll definitely speak on the, the comment about excess moisture. I think, I, we're already seeing that likely in the boot heel. 
you know, it's it's mid March and you know field work activity is ongoing. There's been it's not out of the it's not you know they could be planting they they have planted corn this time of year in southeast Missouri, but it is wet. They got that big rain that was part of Kentucky at the end of February, early March, and then they've been getting some big rains this month as well. So the, I'm sure there is little to no field work activity ongoing in Boot Hill, and so they're running behind. And of course, we've been getting some big rains this past week. Things have really saturated across the state. And so with the six to 10 day outlook calling for above normal precip, it's gonna be a while, I think, before we see any decent drying opportunities. As you, and that could be, you know, more in the Ohio Valley, they've been wetter and Pat's area, particularly those soils are a little heavier. They don't dry out as quickly. As you get further north, soils are drier generally, have not had as much precipitation. So I expect much less delay. In fact, I could see quite a bit of early planting, uh, earlier than average planting for people taking advantage of the dry conditions to go ahead and get moving on that. One, it's just quicker to get things done. Two, uh, corn particularly, if you can plant it early, you wanna take advantage of that and get it to tasseling, hopefully before the hottest conditions midsummer approach. Yeah, there's a lot of timing concerns. Um, it depends on where you are. <laughs> uh, okay, and this, this is actually, uh, this next question is sort of knocks off a couple birds here with one stone. So why is it difficult to predict precip precipitation in North Dakota, Minnesota into April when other areas are labeled as a uh, higher likelihood of above below? So in other words, I, I think the comment is about um, the EC uh, declaration there or uh, letters which stand for equal chances. And in case Pat didn't say it, equal chances is uh, equal chance of above, below, or near normal uh, for precipitation in a lot of these cases. So uh, that, uh, you know, there, between below and between above, there has to be something. And these, I, I don't want to go into great detail, but these are broken out into something we call tercials. So long and short is the, you'll see a 33 uh, on the green line, you'll see a 33 on the brown line. That means there's a better than 33% chance of being, uh, if you're on the left side of the brown line, if you will, um, or tan line, uh, 33 or better chance of being below normal in terms of precipitation. Conversely, 33 and above, better, of better chance of being above normal uh, precipitation on the right side of the green line there in the northeast. Uh, and then there are, you know, isohyets within that that are that are elevated. So the confidence is a little higher. So a lot of this is done. A lot of these maps are made, obviously, with intuition, but or not intuition, <laughs> experience, I should say, as well as models. And so we're looking at a lot of models. We're looking for agreement between models. And we also have this thing called La Nina going on. We have trend that we pay attention to. What is the trend in these areas? Now, each one of these is a factor that we put together into these and, and end up with these maps. And there's a lot more that, that I'm probably not even mentioning. Doug, I, I love calling you out when you use technical terms. What's an ISO high? Okay. ISO high, a line of equal uh, equal amounts there. So, yeah, I figured everybody knew what that was. Um, anyway, so that that's what EC stands for, and why is why is the why is the center part of the country in EC a lot, or a certain part of the country in EC a lot? Well. It's because our predictive ability in those areas some, is somewhat lacking, honestly. And uh, we don't even, so when we look at trend and we look at calibrations and all those things, we just don't see the models behaving very well in those areas. There's a history of that, uh, no matter what we've done to improve them up to this point. So sometimes that explains why you see an EC in there. And, and that is sort of a, a lack of consensus, if you will. And so we could go either way, is what that means. Could be wet, Doug, could be dry. I, Doug, I think a good thing to add on too is that I think we still have a, Pat has the, the monthly outlook. Even the areas that are shaded, like that area that's shaded in the plains that is the third, between the 33 and 40 line on the dry side, that means it leans towards the dry, 
the the chances of being dry are only slightly increased by a few percentage right. points. So it's it's yeah, we have a better chance of being dry, but not a big chance of being dry. It 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 does get more and more worrisome the higher those values get. So Salt Lake City, for example, um, that has a greater than 50% chance of being dry according to this outlook for April, May, and June. That's not good. That's not good, especially if you're if you're coming off your driest year of all time, which Nevada and Utah are. 2020 was their driest year on record, not in the last 30 years. So um, yeah, there are a lot of people who don't like seeing uh, those dry numbers. And and like I mentioned earlier, above normal temperatures. I don't know, Pat and uh, Dennis, if you want to address that right here and now in terms of what that could mean in terms of evaporative potential and why regular precip may not be enough. Pat, you want to go ahead and take a swing at it? Um, right. Well, above not when I, are you talking about this the summer outlook or what we're seeing here in April, May, and June? I'm talking about or above just... normal temperatures either way in July and any time. Above normal temperatures does what? that makes precip hard to catch up basically no matter if you have re uh, average precip right. or whatever right. yeah above normal temperatures obviously will drive evaporative demand and so uh, that's why heat and drought go hand in hand during the growing season especially during the summer so if if we get a verification of above normal temperatures it likely will translate to higher evaporative losses um so you know that's that that's that's part of the, what's put in these in these outlooks. They always they do consider as you go into spring and summer the antecedent soil moisture conditions, and that cat could have an impact if you have a drought already ongoing. You have really not much moisture in the soil profile. That if you don't get that recharge, then there's going to be opportunities uh, as you get into spring and summer where that earth is going to bake and, and it's going to heat up that atmosphere and you're going to get a lot of uh, evaporation, free water evaporation ongoing with these higher temperatures if, if they verify into the spring and summer. And in some of our areas where we do have decent soil moisture, that's, you know, it's it's somewhat less of a concern. Those areas as you go further north, you know, parts of Iowa, parts of the Dakotas, Minnesota, where soil moisture is drier or there's less soil moisture. If you look at increased water usage or, or demand from the atmosphere and less precipitation when you have less mo soil moisture in the bank, so to speak, um, that sets you up for increased chance of, of crop stresses. Okay, we've got a whole bunch of stuff I got to go through. Uh, any comment on the dynamics that led to the big uh, precipitation event in mid-March? Uh, cut off low, Bryce cut off, meaning not attached to the jet stream anymore, but pretty a lot of cold air around it. Perfect setup for upslope flow. Uh, that means water coming. <laughs> that means moisture coming out of the Gulf of Mexico being brought up into the plains and straight west right into the mountains and up slope up the uh, ramp if you will of the of the high plains That's why they call them the high plains by the way because they are higher and when you have uh, air going up you get condensation and it was relatively cold system so uh it, it it was just an amazingly perfect setup and strong winds because of high pressure to the north low pressure to the south funneled a lot of moisture straight into the the higher elevations on the east side of the divide. That's the dynamics that led to that crazy amount of snow, record snows and such. Um, another question is, is there a major uh, severe weather outbreak in the south, a preview of something coming up to the northern plains? I won't go out there because I, I just have no idea. Um, <clears throat> I won't go there on the severe weather part other than to say La Nina. There is some evidence that La Nina years can, but not necessarily in the northern plains, be responsible for an increase in severe weather types. I'll, I'll just say that. Any, anything else you guys want to say? Okay. How big a concern for corn pollination and soybean blooming? Oh, with uh, summer looking the way it is, uh, June, July, August, here it is. Uh, concern. So, well, I'm sorry, what was that again, Doug? But potential corn pollination for and soybean pollination. blooming. Um, is there more concern this year than other years? How about that? I would say yes, there would be. 
because of what we've talked about. Large chunks of our corn areas go into the, the year with less moisture in the soil, increased heat chances and less, you know, maybe lower precipitation chances, increase your possibility of having limited soil moisture when we get to that corn tasseling period. So I would say, you know, it's hard to say that far out. Is our, is, is our risk increase this year? Probably a little bit, yes. Um, I'm gonna jump a question here and cause this will kill a couple of birds with one stone as well. Um, is there a higher, lower or similar chance of double dip La Nina this year, uh, uh, double dip La Nina compared to a month, to, compared with a month ago? In other words, are we seeing a trend towards La Nina reoccurring? Cause we're currently in a La Nina and it's starting to fade. Temperatures are uh, warming actually in the east, Eastern Pacific and uh, we may drop below the criteria that we use to call it a La Nina over the next couple of months. There is evidence that a, as we call it a double dip or two years in a row <clears throat> of La Nina will occur this, this, uh, this fall. And, that, and that's when it usually re rematerializes, if you will. Uh, it's too early to, to be too anxious about that yet, but it's worth mentioning to people who care about it, yes. Um, and someone else and, and, Go ahead. and likely and likely would be weaker than this time around if it does occur. Um, and then um, someone was happy about the new normals uh, moving goalposts. Yes. Okay. Um, and then does NOAA monitor aquifer levels? That is usually state and USGS type folks, I believe who do that. We sort of do on offhandedly, but I'm not sure that's something NOAA monitors. You are right. correct. Anybody? I would agree. Yeah. I think USGS is the main, main, and I think their state people do that too. Um, okay, is there something else we wanna say here? Yeah. Uh, uh, Joe, I think I'll get back to you later on your question about how we deal with the changes every 30 years and moving the goalposts. And even though it's warmer and anomalies are gonna be less in, apparently they're not. <laughs> and in fact, they're not. Um, the key is to look at decadal and really year to year kind of variation in, in climate doesn't tell you very much. It's it, it, at least at the decadal level, maybe even at the 30 year level where you wanna look at big giant climate trends one way or the other, because too much can happen in the year, in a season, um, in February of this year, uh, crazy things can happen. We call that, a lot of that's variability and that's the chaos of the system. And we're sort of used to that to a degree. So, so looking at climate over a long period of time, at least at the decadal levels, is the safest way to go when you're trying to communicate that uh, out often. Um, so any other comments along those lines, communicators on the phone? <laughs> the, the 30, <laughs> I mean, the 30 year average is you're trying to assess you're, you're trying to give a climate context always. We always look at the period, of long, all time period of record to look at overall extremes. So when you're describing the most current conditions in some sort of context, 30 years works best. And that is a standard that's agreed to around the world of looking at the most recent 30 years. Yeah, thank you. And hey, all Doug, right. I'll, I'll, I'll note also, I, I don't, I believe that they're, um, they're tagged to, to be the new ones to be released in May. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. The the new the new values will be out. <clears throat> actually, have a I think I have a <clears throat> sorry uh, sheet I can sh send out broadly. Uh, I can find it uh, that might explain some of the changes coming up. It'll be interesting to see the differences between the last thirty years and the current. I'm sorry, the last thirty years and the thirty years before that. 10 years more vote. So anyway, hey, um, I wanna say thank you to Pat again for spending all this time. And um, 
putting all this together. I, I know it's a pain, but we really do appreciate it. And I, I hope everybody on the call appreciates the time and effort that goes into that. And all the uh, state climatologists and regional climate centers and other federal agencies, USDA, for example, who also uh, give us information that really make a difference. The Corps of Engineers, Bureau of Reclamation are two of those that do that as well, and occasionally others. So I want to say thank you all. Oh, one last thing for those who are sticking on. You, you guys are the real troopers. Eventually, in the next few months, you'll probably be receiving an evaluation, uh, like a survey type thing. That's going to come from the University of Nebraska Drought Mitigation Center. Uh, but it's all about these webinars. So if you feel like you like it, uh, you like coming to these and you want to keep doing them, um, feel free to fill it out and uh, tell us what you think. Anything else, guys? Thank you. All right. Yep. Thank you all. Talk to you next month with Dennis leading the show. Bye-bye.